Okay. Let's get started. So, oh, hold on. <laughs> hello everyone and welcome. Thank you all for joining us virtually for the second presentation in a series of now seven in our winter adventure series. My name is Nicole Villanueva. I'm the education manager at the Eastern Sierra Interpretive Association. We also have Jeff Gabriel, our executive director, helping out with technology. Um, our mission at ECA is to provide high quality interpretive products, exhibits, and programs. A big thank you to you that were able to donate or became a member, which helps us with our mission and to provide more awesome programs such as this. If you're interested in donating or becoming a member, head over to our website, which is sierraforever.org. Also a big thank you to Mammoth Lakes Recreation and the Measure You Grant. So let's jump into our program. We do ask that you please keep yourself muted until the question and answer portion of the program. Tonight, we are joined by Jennifer Crittenden. Jennifer serves as the treasurer on ECS Board of Directors. She splits her time between the beaches of Del Mar and the mountains of, in Mammoth Lakes. Um, she is a former CFO and is the author of several business-related books, as well as the award-winning memoir and travelogue, The Mammoth Letters, Running Away to a Mountain Town. She's originally from Southern Indiana, and today she's joining us to talk about working dogs in the Eastern Sierra. So I'll hand it off to Jennifer. Thank you very much, Nicole, for that nice introduction. Thank you everyone so much for taking the time uh, to join us tonight to talk about those hardworking canines. I'll see if I can share my screen here. And I was really regretful that I wouldn't be able to see you, but I see all of you have turned your cameras off, so no worries. I'll just scare, stare at my slides instead. All right, so here we are today. This is us. Actually, I guess it's the 21st. I have the date wrong. So uh, this is the cover of the book. And I was inspired to write this book. I was hiking up to Crystal Lake, which is off of Lake George. So I should explain. I'm in Mammoth Lakes in the Eastern Sierra. And if you don't know where that is, it's uh, some distance south of Yosemite in a very remote area of the Sierra Nevada. And I'm hiking up to this lake and it's like two people, dog, four people, dog, two dogs, two more people, two more dogs. And I started thinking that it's really funny how Mammoth Lakes is so dog oriented. And I, by then I'd finished the Mammoth Letters and was thinking about the next book project. And I thought, you know, we really have some interesting dogs in this area because we have the avalanche dogs, the search and rescue dogs, we've got the sled dogs, there are some ranch dogs. And so I thought, you know, it'd be kind of cool to write a book about these working dogs, you know, real dogs that live in Mammoth and Bishop. And so this is a cover. And so here are some of the dogs that are featured in the book and we'll, uh, meet some of these during the course of the presentation. But you can see here kind of the variety of jobs that they have and also the breeds uh, that I encountered. This was such a fun project, by far the funnest book project that I've worked for, worked on. And it was Eric actually who kind of got me started because I posted on Facebook and asked, you know, hey, do you know of working dogs that I should know about? And Eric responded and said, I have this really cool black lab, Jenny Rue. And it turns out she really comes from a very prestigious breeding uh, organization in Colorado run by Ann Wickman, who was Colorado's first female park ranger. And so her dogs are you know, specialized in search and rescue, water, cadaver, all these uh, very specialized training for dogs. And when Eric and his wife went there, to, they thought they were just going to pick up the dog. 
But when they got there, Anne was like, uh, no, I'm not going to just let you have one of my dogs. You have to spend the night and I have to get to know you and make sure that, you know, you're okay to, to take the dog. So fortunately, they did pass muster. And so he came home with Jenny, who works on June Mountain. And so she's not part of the Eastern Sierra Canine Organization. Whoops. Uh, that nonprofit was started by Sean Macedonia. And the first dog was this dog that you say, see here, King, a great regal name for this dog. And really, I have to say my hat is off to Sean and King because what they started has endured until today and really grown and just been a tremendous uh, program for Mammoth Mountain. Sean had the presence of mind you know, he'd been working on ski patrol for a, for a number of years. And he said, we don't have an avalanche dog program here. And there is considerable avalanche risk on Mammoth Mountain, more so than other mountains that do have avalanche dogs. So he started working with the folks in Tahoe to start this program. And he was particularly interested in golden retrievers because he thought they would be, you know, kind of a friendly dog and less intimidating than maybe the shepherds or some of the uh, other dogs, Malamutes and so forth. And so I, when I started this project, I thought I would encounter a lot of German shepherds because, you know, that's just what I thought of as a working dog. And so I asked Eric about it. You know, he has black lab. You'll see there's a lot of labs here in Golden Retrievers. So I said to Eric, you know, how come I'm not seeing more German Shepherds? And Eric, he, he's such a funny, nice guy. So he said, German Shepherds are great. You know, really great dogs, great working dogs, you know, very intelligent, really have a lot to offer. That The, the thing about German Shepherds, though, is, well, they bite people. So yeah, turns out that wouldn't work so well for a uh, avalanche dog on Mammoth Mountain with all the kids and people everywhere. But King was great. And there's a, some wonderful stories in there about how Sean uh, found King and decided that he was the right uh, you know, initial dog for the program. They do some really incredible training because of the equipment that they have to be around, all the surfaces that they work on, the noises, the people, just all kinds of things. And as they developed that program, they also figured out kind of some tests to, to be able to choose the puppies. And also, I, I, was, I was really appreciative of Sean's thoughtfulness about what it would mean for the ski patrol the guys or, or women to have a dog and what that would mean for their career as a ski patroller. So he really thought a lot of things through from insurance and medical issues and, um, you know, developed this really fantastic program. So it's still going strong. This is Trico. He's an Entelbucher mountain dog and his handler, Steve, uh, says he's probably said that about 500 times. He's here in the gondola. I don't know if you can see, but yeah, he's riding up in the gondola here. And I was really happy. Steve's mother actually wrote a review on Amazon about my book and, and said that it was accurate, that she knows Steve and Trico. So I was happy about that. The Mammoth Mountain actually developed plushies, like little stuffed animals that represent the real dogs that are in the Eastside Canine program. And so, as you can imagine, Trico's plushie is, is very popular. And there's a story in there about, a, in the book, about a boy who has a Trico plushie who actually meets Trico. So very cool. And now the, the big daddy of the program is Chief. Again, big names for these dogs. So he's kind of the veteran dog. And here he is with his handler, uh, Scott Squiresfeld, who also now runs the Eastside Canine Program. And, you know, again, talk more in the book. I won't go into too much detail here, but, you know, they really... Um, uh, base a lot of their training on the natural prey drive of the dog. 
and they don't have a lot of avalanches here, fortunately, inside the ski boundaries. Uh, but the dogs have been used to locate people who have passed away on the mountain, often from heart attacks, um, and also to search. So there was an inbounds avalanche, I think it was just last year. And so the dogs were used to search to make sure that nobody was caught up in the snow. And in fact, that was the case. No one was, uh, no one was hurt in that, thank goodness. I'll mention here also uh, something about the photographs. I thought when I started the book that I might have to hire a photographer. Um, and when I made some inquiries, it was looked like that was gonna be pretty expensive. But as it turns out, people have fantastic photographs of their dogs. You know, most dog owners, especially people who have working dogs have had themselves taken really great photographs of their dogs or they've hired people to do it. So this really great photo here of King and Sean was taken uh, by Nick Souza. And you know all the photographers are credited in the book, but the book would not have been the same if I hadn't had access to all these great photos. And this is why you came to this talk. So this photo didn't make it into the book, but it is so cute. Um, and you could write a whole story about King and Sean, uh, how they learned together uh, the, to all the details of being an avalanche dog. But here he is right after Sean had gotten him as a puppy. Uh, this is Christina with her golden retriever, Dakota, and she got him because of King. And uh, you know, that's the thing about Sean and King, their legacy is everywhere. So Christina trained with the Mono County Sheriff's Department search and rescue uh, team. And uh, Dakota, this is a great photo of him. He's also such a regal dog, but he is kind of a big dog. And so, you know, as you can see here, sometimes you kind of have to lift the dog, which was, a, you know, hard for her. She's not a huge person and uh, Dakota is big. He also would overheat sometimes and had a tendency to get snowballs on his feet. And so after he retired, you know, working dogs only work for seven or eight years. She got this dog. This is a white Swiss shepherd called Ayla. And she, again, in the book talks quite a bit about training with the dogs and how careful you have to be especially when they're puppies and helicopter training is especially difficult because of the noise and the wind, you know, you can imagine how frightening that could be to a little dog. And some dogs, you know, pick their own jobs. And so uh, this is a group of Sierra dog venture dogs. And uh, again, you know, sometimes people just do such incredible creative things. So Christy and Duncan moved to Mammoth and wanted to start a kind of a dog sitting program, but different in which the dogs would be off leash and able to run free on the public lands. And so they started this program again, very creative, and it's just taken off. You know, the dogs just love being in a group like this, a big gang. Uh, patrolling around. And she said that it, you know, it's been very daunting to have as many as, you know, 17, 20 dogs all off leash. And so they rely very heavily on their own two dogs, Johnny and Oso, who are kind of on the left hand side of this uh, photo. And they really serve as kind of group leaders, you know, and they show the other dogs. How, how this thing works, how you go out and are, are all together. So she's talked quite a bit about dog psychology. Um, but again, as I say, they really rely on these uh, two dogs. And then this is Bolt. Bolt is really famous, actually. He's got some, I don't know, 3,000 followers on Instagram or something. He's a res dog. He lives on a reservation in Bishop. He's an Australian blue healer, and he's just, you know, one of those dogs. He's into everything. He's in charge of everything. So they run a, a kind of horse training and horse uh, riding lesson program there. And so, you know, 
he, Bolt just helps out with everything, but he goes everywhere with them, rides in the truck. And, um, you know, it's just such a lively character, does tricks, plays dead, get all kinds of crazy stuff. And then this is Diller, again, bonus uh, shot for you here. This one I couldn't fit in the book either, but a beautiful picture of this lovely dog. Also a shelter dog, as was Bolt. And um, too many stories to tell here, but his owner, Leah, who does a lot of serious adventuring. She runs an adventure uh, program, commercial adventure program and helps out when there are fires and science projects and all kinds of things. And Diller goes everywhere with her. So really magnificent dog. And here's a couple of retail dogs for you. I couldn't uh, resist having a few of those. So these are Tony and Roger, and they work in a florist shop here in Mammoth. They're kind of interesting dogs. I, you know, learned a lot about breeds, but learned quite a bit about uh, French bulldogs. They were bred to be companion dogs, and they are. Although they, I would say, they also serve kind of as guard dogs in that shop. You know, they're really aware of when there are people inside there, what they're doing. But they're surprisingly outdoorsy, right? So they've really embraced the Eastern Sierra lifestyle. They really like to go fishing and swimming and hiking, and you know, they're just kind of up for anything. And this is Bella. So I wanted to have a hunting dog because, you know, a lot of people in the Eastern Sierra hunt and dogs are extremely useful. And you know, again, their breeding comes into play and they get a lot of training to help with the hunting. And, you know, I'm very admiring of, of uh, what they contribute to that process, even though I'm not a hunter myself. So a sporting goods store in Bishop hooked me up with Eric, who has this you know, pretty talented dog, uh, Bella. And so I got in touch and I asked for a photo, you know, I would gather the story and take notes and all that. So he sends me this photo and I was like, huh? Cause you know, I know this is like the classic photo that you show, right? For hunting dogs, but I wasn't quite sure about including, you know this kind of pile of, of dead ducks right? I mean, it is what she does, right? Um, I do have a very nice picture of her in a blind, but I did get back to Eric and say, you know, I'm just not sure. I, I tried to like blur out this part of the photo so it wouldn't be quite so obvious and it just didn't really work. So Eric, you know, rightly so was like, well, hang on a second, you know, this is what she does. But uh, after a little bit of back and forth, he did send this photo of Bella with her puppies. And my husband did say that I would probably sell more copies uh, with this photo instead of the dead ducks uh, photo. So anyway, so this whole thing I was kind of showing off right now, what I knew about hunting dogs. And my cousin in Wisconsin is a big hunter. And so I sent him, you know, the photo, the one that I couldn't use of Bella and he wrote back, I thought he'd be so impressed. He wrote back and he was like, what kind of name is Bella for a hunting dog anyway? So he wasn't very impressed. This is my favorite dog. This is Rusty. And so he's a cattle dog uh, who works just a little bit north of the Mono Lake area. A lot of ranching up there. This is serious hard work, you know, really dangerous. The cattle can stomp the dogs or trap them. Uh, the, the dogs can get sick. It's really dusty, thirsty work. Um, you know, the, the ranchers try and um, cycle the dogs so that they don't get too exhausted. But this is really, really hard work. This is where you really see the working dogs in action and what they contribute right, to an operation like this. And especially, you know, you're dealing with some angry cattle who don't want to do what you want them to do. And I'll uh, show a photograph here. So I was really happy when we had the book festival in 2019 after the uh, book came out. This is the Eastern Sierra Book Festival. And uh, 2020 was our third year 
Uh, so 2019 was the second year that we held it. And I invited all the dogs to come because the book uh, came out at that festival. And Rusty came. I was, you know, it's like having somebody come to your party, right? I was uh, so excited to have Rusty come. He actually was not that comfortable at the book festival. It was like, where are the cattle and why are all these people staring at me? Um, but I was really honored to meet him. So here we are at the book festival. All the dogs came in the afternoon. It was such a zoo. We probably, there were probably between 35 and 40 dogs in the book. So a lot of them and almost all of them came along with their, you know, associated pets and, and so forth. It was kind of nuts. And I hadn't planned anything formal, like for when the dogs would be there. But Robert Yoki, who's here uh, on the left in the hat, is the president of the Southern Mono Historical Society. And we have the book festival at the historical Hayden cabin here in Mammoth. And Robert, uh, people were saying, well, don't you wanna do anything with all these dogs? And so Robert grabbed the microphone and started interviewing the dogs on the stage, which was definitely the funnest part of the festival. And it, and it was a real hoot as he was uh, talking to the handlers. So here he's talking with Ann Parks and her dog Tinker. I don't know if you can see this, but Tinker is studying to be a guide dog for the blind. And Anne is an organizer of that program here in Mammoth and Bishop, where they do the puppy raising for the guide dog. So they have the dogs for uh, a year or so until they're ready to go back to do more formal training to become a guide dog. Not many of the dogs make the cut to become a guide dog. And there's a... Um, there's a movie out there about, about that whole process, which is very interesting. And then on the right, uh, this is me with Mike and Journey. Journey is a border collie. Look how great she is. And I'm dressed as Laura Ingalls Wilder. That's why I look kind of funny, or partly at least why I look funny. I was really excited that day to meet all these dogs. And Journey is an amazing dog. She's quite famous now in Southern California as a cadaver dog, or as they call them now, a human remains detection dog. And uh, she's really skilled, very well trained, both she and Mike, and also his wife, and they have another border collie that they've trained to do that work. A really uh, amazing uh, people and dogs. Journey wor worked at the campfire which I don't know if you know that fire. It's a terrible name to call it the campfire. Uh, but in 2018, it is the deadliest and most destructive fire in California history. It killed 85 people and burned over 18,000 structures. It completely wiped out almost four towns, including the town of Paradise. And here is this incredible photograph of Journey alerting Oh, well, she's working and uh, that's her handler, Mike. And this photo was printed in the Washington Post. Um, this is also a bonus for you. I couldn't include this photo in the book. The um, photographer, Ricky Cariotti, was very nice and very enthusiastic about me including the photo, but the, he doesn't own the rights, as it turns out, when you work for the Washington Post. They, in fact, give those rights to Getty Photos, and Getty wanted, I don't know, many, many hundreds of dollars to use the photo, so I wasn't able to use it. Uh, but here, you get to see it. It's a very remarkable photo but you can see the destruction and also the, the difficulty of the work that they do, the, the environment in which they work, very challenging. And here's Patty. Uh, she and her husband have a sheep farm. In fact, if you travel from Southern California up to Mammoth, you will often see her sheep uh, near Thomas Place, uh, down in the meadow there, again, near a very old uh, cabin. And here she is with some great Pyrenees puppies. These dogs are so great. And there are more really great photos of them in the book. So they're uh, sheep branchers and these great Pyrenees, which I'd never even heard of that breed before, work as guardian dogs for the herds. Uh, very interesting dogs, huge for one thing, as you can see here. 
but they're nocturnal. So they work at night to protect the herd really from some, you know, pretty ferocious predators, uh, mountain lions, uh, bears might not be so much of an issue, but coyotes. Uh, so yeah, very important dogs, interesting personality. And there are a lot of stories in the book about Katie and Katie Bell that were given to me by Jennifer Rosner, who runs the McGee Creek Pack Station. So you can see some of their pack animals here. That operation has about 30 border collies that they also use for the sheep to, to herd and control the sheep during the day for all kinds of things. You know, every time they have to pen them or put them in trucks or give them shots, take care of them, then the dogs come into play. And, you know, Patty has said, the dogs know what to do. Sometimes she doesn't even have to uh, give a command or anything. So this is Dot, uh, one of the, dogs that they depend on a lot. You can see her uh, taking charge of all these sheep here. It's also interesting, a lot of the shepherds that they use now are from South America. And so they give their commands in Spanish and the dogs very quickly become bilingual. So you can give them commands in English or in Spanish, either way, uh, they'll, they'll uh, follow what they're told to do. There are some great videos on YouTube where you can see herding dogs at work. It's really amazing, you know, some aerial shots and you can see the dog strategy for how they're gonna move cattle or sheep. It's pretty cool. And then I have to include, I have some agility dogs. I had to include Willow in here, this beautiful dog who lives in Bishop. Uh, she's owned by Lynn Almeida, who's the owner of Spellbinder Books, the bookstore in Bishop. And Willow has been in the top five in the nation for the last number of years in agility in the collar, collie category. Again, just incredible training and the speed at which they work and the, the how fast they react to commands. Pretty incredible to watch. Again, lots of videos on YouTube uh, where you can see them at work and the speed at which they work. It's really, really fun. And this is Buster. He's probably the most famous of all the dogs in the book. Uh, he trained with King as an avalanche dog and was owned by a homicide detective, Paul Dosty, and uh, eventually was trained as a human remains detection a dog. He traveled all over the world and found uh, missing American soldiers, did all kinds of amazing work. This is really a very ghoulish photo, even though it, it doesn't look like it. Here, Buster is alerting, he's super happy, but he's actually found uh, some signs of human remains below this really creepy looking barn. Uh, there was just some really horrible stories about the work that he's done, but here he is, you know, just doing his job, super happy to be doing all that. And I wanted to finish with this photo of all these happy dogs up in the Eastern Sierra. And thanks uh, for people in the book who helped me and the nonprofits that part of the proceeds from the book sales go to Eastside Canine, Guide Dogs, A Pause for Healing, which is for therapy dogs, and then the Agility Group, and then also Mono County Search and Rescue. The book is on sale at ECA's online store. You can see the link there and some dates to mark down the Eastern Sierra Book Festival, I hope will be in person this year on July 18th. And then the Eastern uh, Sierra Interpretive Association History Conference will be October 29th through 31. Again, we're hoping in person. And don't miss that, that's really a, a fantastic conference. So thank you very much and I'd love to hear uh, some questions. Thank you. And if you want to put them in the chat or if you want to unmute yourself, whatever works for all of you. Jennifer, how, how, if I may go, um, how many dogs uh, did you um, 
you know, explain about or tell the stories about in the book? How many dogs? I think there are about 35 to 40 dogs in there. Some of them are kind of clumped together, you know, because like the sheep operation, they have some, you know, 30 dogs. And even some of those great Pyrenees, you know, they're, they're, they're sort of a pack of them. But yeah, somewhere between 35 and 40. There are a few in there I didn't talk about tonight. There's the little uh, Chihuahua mix that was a shelter dog that just uh, kind of sings for as its job. And uh, it actually tried to bite me when we met. Uh, so, but yeah, you know, <laughs> takes all it takes don't, all kinds, right? <laughs> don't bite your author dogs. No. Yeah, right. <laughs> Do you have any Huskies in the program? No, I I was excited to have some Huskies. I uh, didn't encounter any, you know, just as it as it happened, as it developed. Since then, I've seen some around town. Huskies have a really interesting personality. They seem to be kind of their own dog, right? So th th a lot of the owners have described that, yeah, Huskies, you know, as far as working dogs, not quite so much. I would have loved to include some of the Malamutes that they use for the sled dog operation down by the airport. Um, but Jim, the, who's the owner there, has had health issues. So I was never able to hook up with him, but that's one, you know, like rats. I, I wish I would have been able to include them. I did in, encounter a couple of the handlers when I was hiking up to Minaret Vista they used to use that mile long track to train the dogs and some you know really interesting stories to tell and again more training and breeding one of the things one that operator told me that I thought was really interesting was that he you know Jack London talks a lot about sled dogs in his book and the uh, that handler said he didn't quite agree with the way Jack London said he would have arranged the dogs, like where the alpha dog would be relative to the other dogs. So I thought that was pretty cool. It's like, hmm, all right. <laughs> yeah. Just uh, interesting to see how Jack London described it. And then somebody who's really boots on the ground would actually handle those dogs. But yeah, I, I would lo have loved to include more Huskies. Hi, Jennifer. Oh, hey, hi. Uh, this was a lot of fun. Thanks. Oh, good. Yeah, thanks for coming. Yeah, yeah. old so, friends and new. Yeah, so um, it seemed like most of the dogs were purebred. You did mention a couple times shelter dogs, but I didn't really have a sense if those were mixed breed mutts or if, I mean, do mutts ever get a chance to do work or is it mostly reserved for purebred dogs? Yeah, so I think a lot of the people who start out by saying, I want a working dog, you know, like the Great Pyrenees or those Border Collies or like the Avalanche dogs, they go to a particular breeder. And, it, you know, it's a, it's not, I wouldn't say it's controversial, but it's something to think about, right? Are you going to go and, and buy a breeder dog or are you going to try and use a dog from the shelter? There were quite a few dogs in this book that are from shelters and they are mixed breed, like Bolt, for example. And so there you kind of get to see, even when it's a mix, like what dominant characteristics there are. And I, I'm not an expert at this at all, but just what I've learned from, from talking to those people, you know, so you could really see, so Bolt is an Australian healer and you could really see that breeding come out in him, right? So she didn't try and train him to be like the corral dog for the horses and mules, but he just naturally fell into that. So she tells this story too about like, if she goes into the house in front of Bolt, like something happens in his brain and he'll like nip her on the heels, like, yes, get in there. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's in their brain, right? That when you're following an animal, you, you want them to make them go in there, right? Yeah, so it's interesting to see that, that breeding come out, right? And Diller too, you know, he's a mix, but again, you can see partly from his coat, right? How comfortable he is in the snow. He can stay outside in snowstorms and just gnaw on his bones out there. And Leah tells this story about 
getting her dogs these bones from the meat market and throwing them out there in the snow and then looking out later because it's a tremendous snowstorm. The dogs are just out there, you know, it's this crazy wind and swirling snow and they're just out there gnawing on their bones. <laughs> yeah, so you, you see that that come out in the dogs. Yeah, it's interesting, that breeding issue. I see Leah is in the chat, actually. Yeah, so she says, thanks for including Diller. Yeah, really cool dog. How long does it take to train those dogs? Well, I, you know, I guess I would say it depends on the work that they're doing. Again, I'm not an expert, but you know, Patty, I kind of go back to her because with those border collies, you know, I've asked her about training them and she said they kind of train each other. So the, you know, there they'll have, they trade dogs with, with other people so that the dogs don't get too inbred, but they basically will just have a whole litter of border collies and then they trade them off to other sheep operations or cattle operations, kind of depending on the temperament of the dog. So for her, she doesn't do a lot of training. As I say, they learn, you know, the, the English or Spanish commands compared to say those search and rescue or those cadaver dogs. I mean, I think they're probably years training those dogs to get to that level of, of really being, to, being able to operate on some of those very sophisticated operations where you're flying the dog around the world. You know, that, that's a whole different kettle of fish, so to speak. So Elias says here, uh, she's the Diller, Diller's uh, owner. She says, We're, we'll be doing post-fire soil erosion, geology, and road survey soon, presume with Diller at her side and hoping for okay spring weather. Yeah, so she tells some great stories in the book, and there's some interesting uh, photographs of of Diller, you know, out in those operations. I, I remember asking Leah how much you know, it helped her to have Diller with her when she's out, you know, in these faraway places, remote places, and whether or not she felt safer with having Diller, because Diller's big. And she said, yeah, my mom feels better about me having Diller. <laughs> any other, any other questions? Don't be shy. I get, I ran through my slides kind of quick, so. Oh, Barbara says he at Hayden Cabin. Yeah, so I hope we get to do the book festival where uh, we seem to be doing a lot of vaccinations here in Mono County. People are cranking through there. So yeah, I'm hopeful we can all get vaccinated and be safe and be back at Hayden Cabin. Uh, Jeff says, is there a second edition? Yeah, you know, that would be really fun to do, especially if I could get the sled dogs in there, because that's just a whole different, you know, type of dog and, and um, the things that they have to know really, you know, you're pulling, right, as a sled dog, so, and, and working as a team, so pretty different. So yeah, I don't know, we'll, we'll uh, have to We'll have to see if I can encounter more dogs. It sure was fun to do this one. And, and one of the really great things was seeing all those photographs and, you know, people really have fantastic photographs of their dogs. Are you waving a hand, David? Mm -hmm. well, I was just gonna say, if you do that and you get into the sled dog story, go back in history in the 1930s when a guy named Ted had uh, delivered the mail uh, from, you know, between Mammoth and, June Lake and Levining and West Portal during the construction years for LA's tunnel. And um, there's all these pictures that are out there of the sled dogs, you know, in the snow and downtown Levining and, and other places, you know, so um, you can you can pull that history in. Yeah, that would be more of a historical thing. There are really great photographs of him and his dogs up at the Tamarack Lodge. Yeah, and you know, it was such an important thing to get the mail through in those days. I mean, that, you know, that was what people really needed the mail and for him to 
do that year after year is really a huge contribution to the community. But, you know, it's one thing, can't remember if I said that when I was rushing through my slides, you know, you really see the contribution that the dogs and their handlers make to the community, right? They're really part of the place. And there was that little dog that worked or was at sort of a retail dog that worked at the, another t-shirt shop in Mammoth. And I swear when that dog passed away, people just mourned that dog. You know, so many people in town knew that dog and yeah, it was, it was yeah, they're part of the community. Oh, so Fee has asked a question here, do I have a dog? And I don't, but I will show you this photo if I could do this here. So one of the reasons that I asked about the um, German Shepherds was because I had been raised with German Shepherds. So the, here's a picture of me uh, with the first dog that we had. This was Jet. My parents got her as a puppy on Long Island. So this uh, photograph was taken when I was really small and we were living on Long Island. And she was a fantastic dog. You know, my parents still tell stories about her. And again, she just had a lot of natural instincts about keeping the children safe. And, you know, my parents talk about how they'd go to the beach with her and she would kind of set up a perimeter for the children. It was like, okay, this is this is my area. I'll patrol this area. This is where I keep people safe. You know, I'm going to keep the kids out of the waves. And, you know, just incredible how they, how the dogs, you know, kind of naturally do this. But we did move with her shortly after that to a big piece of property in Southern Indiana, where I mostly grew up. And yeah, just again and again, how useful she was as a guard dog. But also there were times when we would get lost on that property, or at least one time when we got lost. And my dad just said to her, you know, let's go home. And off she went, you know, she clearly knew the way. So yeah, we just followed her back to our house. But yeah, dogs really useful, right? Yeah, so I was telling Nicole and Jeff before we started that I married a non-pet person. And we've been married, I don't know, 27 years or something. That, but, so you would think by now I would have won this argument about having a dog. Uh, have not been successful yet in getting a dog, but wish me luck. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe eventually I'll be able to convince him. <laughs> yeah, good question, B. Oh, and Chara says, it looks, sounds like that could be a presentation for the history conference about uh, Ted and his sled dogs. Yeah, I think that would be fascinating. And there's a bunch of stories too. I think um, Adele Reed might talk about it, how Ted had, Ted, David, you might uh, remember some of the details, but that he used to keep the dogs kind of down there, actually very close, I think, to where Hayden Cabin is, and that the uh, kids in the town used to go by and uh, get to know the, the sled dog, Ted's sled dogs. So yeah, definitely part of the town and part of the community. <laughs> yeah, so Mike Lane says, I hope I hope I win the dog argument. We'll see. Uh, well, you know, it's one thing I've thought about is if we did get a dog, what kind of dog we would get. And I've learned so much about these different breeds, you know, before I probably just would have gotten a shepherd, right? Because that was what I knew. And I have a lot of respect for those dogs. But um, but yeah, now I'm not so sure. I've learned about some pretty interesting breeds. And, you know, obviously the mixes too offer, you know, really interesting combination of traits. So as Leah always says about Diller, you know, we got this sheltered dog. It's it's just a, a gamble what you get. And we've ended up with this really magnificent dog. Yeah, so you can get lucky. Have you ever worked with a wine rhino? I have not. I there's some they're kind of photogenic, right? So I think there's a book of photographs of them. They just they're quite character, right? It looks like they're real characters. Have you worked with them at all? I had a we had a pet one and he was a master at 
just being mischievous. Like he would, he loved just to be mischievous. And they have a lot of personality, and they're very energetic. They're like a hunting dog. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're kind of they're pretty big dogs, I think, from what I remember of the photographs. But yeah, it looks like they have a lot of personality for sure. Ours was a hundred pound. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty big. All right. Thank you again, everyone. I really appreciate your spending time and learning about our uh, working dogs. And who knows, maybe there's more on the horizon. Thank you so much for joining us, Jennifer, and sharing those awesome pictures of those dogs. That was really cool. Yeah, they're great dogs. Thank you all for joining us too. Thank you. I'm going to ask all my friends to watch the video recording. Good. Thank you.